Good evening. I'm Ronald Lauder, President of the World Jewish Congress. I want to welcome you all tonight and thank you all for coming here to the World Jewish Congress presentation of the Theodor Herzl Award to Lord George Weidenfeld. The World Jewish Congress was founded in 1936 when a concerned group of Jewish leaders gathered in Vienna to draw attention to the growing threat coming out of Nazi Germany. And in 1942, Gerhard Reiner, the then Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress, sent a telegram to diplomatic channels which provided the first documented information of the Nazi plan to exterminate the Jewish people. The World Jewish Congress was, was the first to sound the alarm, but sadly, as we all know, the world did not listen. Over the past 79 years, the World Jewish Congress has stood in the forefront of protect, protecting Jewish communities around the world. Just as we sound the alarm today, to the growing threats coming from the Middle East, particularly Iran, and also, frankly, right here in Europe. It is a tremendous honor for me personally to serve as president of this wonderful and important organization that does so much vital work. Just as the World Jewish Congress fights anti-Semitism in all its pernicious forms, we are also concerned with any form of hatred directed at anyone on the basis of religion and race. Over the past two years, the World Jewish Congress has also drawn attention to the growing massacres of Christians throughout the Middle East and Africa. We do this because we Jews have learned the hard way that world silence can lead to catastrophe. And we know that no one is safe if even just one group is targeted. Tonight is not the night of having a fundraising event. It is an evening to honor a great man. But I am sure that George Weidenfeld, who was an honorary vice president, only the two in the world, of the World Jewish Congress would agree that there is no better organization to support at the present time. George, is that okay to say it like this? <laughs> I had a promise not to fundraise. George hates to fundraise. This has to be the most difficult group to get quiet. Um, I don't know if you ever had a chance to see pictures of George starting from the age of five to the age of 95. But there's some fabulous pictures of him. I told George he was great looking and still is. Uh, we live in a world that is afraid to speak out. It's not that human beings are cowards. It's just that there are very few truly heroic people in the face of evil. Most people are fearful and remain silent. The classic example of this occurred in the 1930s when Adolf Hitler made his intentions perfectly clear. Yet everyone chose to look the other way. We see it again here today, here in England, which has joined the international chorus singling out Israel as a scapegoat for the world's problems. But there are some people in our world, just a few, who have the courage, the temerity, to stand up for what is right. They speak out when they see injustice. One of these men we honor tonight, his name is George Weidenfeld. <laughs> 
statesman, scholar, publisher of almost 10,000 works, cultural critic, the list goes on because George Weidenfeld has managed to squeeze several lifetimes into one. But that one life almost ended when he was 18. George escaped from his native Vienna and the Nazis just in time. He was saved by a Christian family and brought here to London. It was that same family that showed him an ad in the Times that the BBC was looking for linguists. It wasn't just his native German that caught the attention of the BBC, but George was also fluent in English, Italian, and French, plus a solid base in Spanish, Dutch, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This young, this young man somehow landed the job. He very quickly became an indispensable asset in the war effort. And here is something you probably don't know. After his long days, he was something of a star doing stand-up imitations of Hitler and Mussolini. I must say, I've heard these um, impersonations, and they're fantastic. But in the face of adversity, George has never lost his sense of humor. With the war barely over, he established the famous publishing company, Weidenfeld and Nicholson. Here is a short list of the memoirs that he published. Charles de Gaulle, Harold Wilson, Lyndon Johnson, Helmut Kohl, Conrad Adenauer. From Israel, there was Shimon Peres, Itzhak Rabin, Dedi Kalik, Chaim Herzog, Yigal Lon, Moshe Dayan, and a woman named Golda. After the war and the Holocaust, George remained in the front lines and somehow found time to serve as Chaim Weizmann's chief of staff. For those of you in this room who are starting to feel a slight sense of inadequacy, don't be concerned. You are not alone. George has never forgotten how a Christian man and woman took him in and saved not just his life, but his family's as well. He has been a bridge and inspiration to one of the great peacemakers, Pope John Paul II, who was also a friend. And of course, he published the Pope's memoirs as well. George Weidenfeld still has extraordinary energy. He still works 12 hours a day with one purpose in mind, to make this world a better place. His constant efforts on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people has never stopped. My own experience is a perfect example. I first met George when I was serving as U.S. Ambassador to Austria in the late 1980s. That was during the Kurt Waldheim affair. The former U.N. Secretary General who hid his Nazi past and then ran for President of Austria and won. It turned out it wasn't just wall time that tried to hide his Nazi past. It was the whole country. And in 1987, George Weidenfeld stood with me and supported my efforts to correct the record and explain to the world that the Austrians during World War II were never the first victims of Nazism, a lie that had been accepted for 30 years. They were more than willing partners of the Third Reich. In fact, Austrians were some of the most fierce Nazis. They conveniently forgot that Eichmann was an Austrian, that Hitler was an Austrian. George 
did not forget. The chief lessons I learned from George in those years was never to be afraid to speak the truth and never worry if you go up against popular opinion. When it comes to anti-Semitism and hate of any kind, there's only one side to be on. And if you see anti-Semitism, don't pretend it's not there. This man knows right from wrong. He understands a simple truth and that there is a difference between good and evil. And he has made his life's work to make sure that good will triumph. At the age of 95, I think we can safely assume that George is not going to retire. He continues to mentor younger people. It's everyone in this room. Uh, he, remain, he remains on the front line. His famous dinner parties with his devoted wife, Annabelle, continue to be one of London's most coveted events. George has found himself at the important junctures of history over the past century, and he has always shown us the moral way to proceed. Yes, George is a Renaissance man, but he is a Renaissance man with a Jewish heart. Theodor Herzl was a man like George Weidenfeld, who spoke out against anti-Semitism. And like George, he had the rare ability to turn words into action. The Theodor Herzl Award is the number one award in the Jewish world today. Former recipients include Shimon Peres, Elie and Marion Wiesel, Henry Kissinger, and posthumously Ronald Reagan, and Axel Springer. Almost all these people George has published works by. There are many of Britain's greatest treasures here in this museum. But here is one more. It's my great honor to award this year's Theodor Herzl Award to this great man and my dear friend, George Weidenfeld. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Ronald Lauder, I'm deeply moved by your words. They were so heartfelt, so sincere, and I am so proud to have been asked to become honorary vice chairman of this remarkable institution, the World Jewish Congress. I'm deeply honored also with this award because Theodor Herzl is not just a figure in the tribal annals of the Jewish people, he's also a world figure, but for me personally, the man, his message means a great deal and permeated my personal life, my political life, my professional life. I'm a lifelong Zionist, brought up in Austria. I had the great good fortune to serve in the BBC in an enormously important job in the last few years as a diplomatic correspondent attached to the so-called freedom movements and European governments in exile. That is, that is to say, I had to get stories out of the Free French and on the gold, Sikorsky, Benish, but also the freedom movements, the free Indians, the free Africans, and the Zionist organization. And there, of course, I met the old friends and made new friends, Weizmann, Ben-Gurion, Charette, and so on. But Theodor Herzl meant so much to me. He permeated my life, also my professional life. In the 70 years of publishing, I published three biographies of Herzl. The last one has only just appeared, published by the, the, written by that great 
historian, philosopher, and diplomat Shlomo Avineri. But the man, his message, meant a great deal to me because of three aspects that are so important. He was, for me, the last of the great Hebrew prophets. He was, for me, also the great redeemer who managed to make some of his prophets, uh, prophecies come true. And he was, for me, also the apostle to the Gentiles. You see, the extraordinary thing about Herzl was that here was a man who moved mountains and had a very short life. He died at the age of 44, but that's not all. Only in the last seven, eight, nine years was he aware he was Jewish. I mean, he was assimilated, he was emancipated. Of course, he knew he was Jewish, but he had no feeling for the Jewish people, not very much. For one moment, as an undergraduate and member of a very feudal, elegant student corps, he experienced anti-Semitism because at the age of 23, in 83, 1883, two waves of anti-Semitism swept through Austria, a plebeian and a patrician one. The plebeian one was run by that mayor of Vienna, Luega, the first of modern anti-Semitic politicians and who, who, who mobilized the lower middle classes and had a strong anti-Semitic background. And the patrician one were the haute bourgeoisie, more than the aristocracy, and they were pan-German. They despised the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. They wanted the Anschluss, and they were anti-Semitic. And so when he was an undergraduate, he had this awful experience that he was asked to resign from his corps because the Albia, this, this very feudal student corps, decided that Jews had to resign. They formed a cartel of student corps known as the Weithofen Cartel, named after a small village near Vienna, where the old said, the Jew is not a gentleman, you mustn't give him satisfaction, he must get out. But his reaction was very odd. He didn't immediately think he was going to be a Zionist. On the contrary, he thought, well, mass conversion. Let's all be baptized or forgive, for, find some way of disappearing. And then forgot about it and things ca calmed down in Austria. And then much later, when he, who was then in his mid-30s, and as you know, he died at the age of 44, in his mid-30s, his newspaper, because he's one of the great journalists, playwrights, even the Imperial Work Theater played his plays, he was sent to Paris to cover the Dreyfus trial. And that was a decisive event. After a day in court, when he suddenly realized there in the land of the free, liberté, égalité, fraternité, a Jewish officer of the upper middle class was accused of being a traitor and sending his country to the enemy, there he experienced a form of anti-Semitism that was really hurting. And one day, as he walked across the bridge of the Seine to his hotel, always impeccably dressed, top coat, a, a, a long beard, he looked like an Assyrian, Prince, a Semitic experience, out, out, he walked back to his hotel and on the way two street urchins ran after him and said, Sal Juif, Sal Juif. And he was so shattered that he, had him, that he locked himself up for three days, asked the porter to bring up food and wrote a science fiction political pamphlet called The Jewish State. Political Zionism, the Jews must have a state in Palestine. When that pamphlet was published, and by the way, an English version appeared in the Jewish Chronicle at the time, when it was published, the reaction was terrible. The wealthy Jews, the liberal uh, public said, what is this extraordinary thing? He wants to suggest mass exodus of Jews in Austria 
This is terrible. This will lead to more anti-Semitism. But the Jews in the eastern provinces of Austria-Hungary, in today's Ukraine and Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary, read it and were absolutely fascinated. And he got letters and asked to give lectures. And he took three weeks off and went on a lecture tour. And as he, his train left the Austrian heartland and went into the eastern marches, every station were red carpets, hundreds, in some cases thousands of Jews, wearing a transparency of his photograph with the inscription, Long live Herzl, King of the Jews. That was the beginning of the world Zionist movement. And then extraordinary things happened. In a ridiculously short time, he created a movement. An unbelievable situation. No examples. Only very few. They were, even those were quite different and pale. Alexander the Great died at the age of 33, but he was the son of a great warrior king with an army. At the age of 19, 20, 21, he was already running campaigns. In the world of cultural music, Mozart, Schubert had died young, but they were wunderkinder. They produced classics when they were toddlers. But Herzl only realized that there was a Jewish problem a few years before he died. And he created in a feverish way this world Zionist movement. And so for me, he is three things. He's the last of the Hebrew prophets. He is the great deliverer a redeemer, because so much that he prophesied became truth, some of it even while alive, but most of it in the years after his death. And thirdly, for me, he is the apostle to the Gentiles. And this is the most extraordinary experience. And so he also dominated my life. I think to understand what it all meant and how quickly he succeeded in doing what he did. Let me take you on a flight of fancy between reality and fancy. I'm going to be 96 in a few months' time. Assuming I was born in 1990. Assuming for a moment I had been born in 1877 and I would have been 20 years as a student and gone to the first Congress in Baal together with a few students and young intellectuals and not with a Jewish elite at all, with idealists. And Herzl would have said to me, next to others, hire yourself a dress suit, hire yourself a silver-topped cane stick and come and join this Congress. And then he hired a band and what did the band play? a potpourri of Richard Wagner. Twelve years after Richard Wagner's publication of his anti-Semitic essay, The Juden in the Musik, The Jews in Music. Don't ask me to explain it. These are the mysteries of Zeitgeist. There is an explanation, but it's for another lecture. Now, so what happened? I would have been then at the Congress. Twenty years later, the Balfour Declaration. He was already dead but his successors did it for him. And I would have probably then been able to stand outside number 10 Downing Street, jubiling that the Jews now had the Balfour Declaration. 30 years after that, I would still be in the ripe age, and then comes the real fact, I was already there, the State of Israel was proclaimed by the United Nations at Lake Success. Twenty years after that, the Six-Day War, when I spent the fourth and fifth day of the Six-Day War as the guest of General Herzog, later President Herzog, the first governor of the old city of Jerusalem, and we had two nights of unforgettable experiences. It was the fourth and the fifth night, and among the guests were journalists like Randolph Churchill and his son, Winston Jr. and Lady Pamela Berry, the wife of the proprietor of the, the Telegraph, 
and some very distinguished military critics, some of them former generals of the army, and we were discussing the war. And Randolph Churchill turned to Moshe Dayan, who passed by to the dinner party, and said, General Dayan, tell me, I want to know, I've studied what you did in the south in the Egyptian campaign, when you were uh, tanks, and you didn't have too many tanks, recklessly drove into the infantry of the enemy without infantry backing on your side. And Dayan, quietly, in his deadpan way of talking, said, but Mr. Churchill, we had infantry. We had wonderful regiments. I can give you the names. Belsen, Buchenwald, Meidenach, Auschwitz. That was our infantry. Can there be better regiments than that? And on the fifth day, we were having dinner, and an orderly came and whispered something into the ear of General Herzog. And General Herzog got up, choking with emotion, and said, gentlemen, we have scaled the Golden Heights. I might say the war is over. Now, I'll tell you the story for the following reason. I could have still been there for a few years. In other words, within one lifetime, through Herzl, prophecy turned into victory, independence, and recognition. Because the week after the Six Day War, a man like Little Hart, the great military critic, a man like Vladimir Dormesson, a French literary critic, the uncle of the famous writer, wrote almost the same article. We must admit in all seriousness that the new Israeli army is probably the finest fighting force in the world today. That was Theodor Herzl's legacy. So I say to you how Herzl, what he meant to me, how important it is. And now I want to talk to you quickly about Herzl as not only as the Redeemer, the Redeemer who redeemed so many of his promises, but also as the Apostle to the Gentiles. Because he was not just a tribal figure, he worked on the world stage. And he wished to make friends with non-Jews. He was able to go and see not only friends, on the contrary, he went to the Tsarist Minister of the Interior, responsible for pogroms. He went to see the Pope, who wasn't particularly friendly, in those days, he saw the French, he saw the British, even some American politicians, and he made friends. And now the first Zionist of Christian persuasion was an English clergyman called the Reverend Heckler. This Reverend Heckler was the first non-Jew who saw the point. And he became a court preacher of the Grand Duke of Baden, who in turn was the uncle of the Kaiser. And he said to the Grand Duke, you must meet Dr. Herzl. And the Grand Duke met him and was very impressed and offered his help and said to him, I will introduce you to the Kaiser. And the Kaiser, in a famous tableau meeting outside the ramparts of Jerusalem, where the Kaiser was visiting Palestine as the guest of the Sultan, his ally, he visited, he received on horseback Dr. Herzl and four or five other Zionist delegates and promised to look at the memorandum and see what he could do to help with the Sultan to give the Jews a charter in Palestine. At the same time, in England sat a brilliant young biochemist with the name of Chaim Weizmann, who did the same thing made friends with people like Balfour and Lloyd George and lobbied to get also support. And then later, long after Herzl had died already by that time, you're now talking about the, the years before the war and during the war, he did some very successful lobbying. And then you must realize a very important situation. World jury was split. German jury was pleased with the attitude of the Kaiser 
or people like the Grand Duke who were friendly. But on the other hand, and also they had one great thing. They were on the other side of the Russian Tsar. And the Russian Tsar, in the heart of the Jews of the time, was almost, not quite, a Hitler. Because the pogroms were all done by the Cossacks, by the Russian Tsar. And all these thousands and thousands of Jewish refugees on the east side in New York were refugees from the Tsar. So, in other words, the German Jews could say, we fight with the German army against the Tsar. On the other hand, the British Jews uh, were on the side of Russia, but on the other hand, had their own uh, ideas and were very patriotic British Jews and had reason to be patriotic if the Jews had a very good time in England. And then came that period which is so well described in the book on the sleepwalkers when they were preparing for World War I when in fact both sides were fighting this rivalry about what to, how to get the Americans into the war or keep them out of war. The Germans on the one side and the British. And the German Jews appealed to their Jewish friends in America and don't let forget that the original great Jewish families in America were pro-German, the Salzburgers of the New York Times the Rosenwalds of Sears Roebuck, they sent their children to Berlin and Göttingen and Heidelberg and not to Oxford and Cambridge. And they, of course, were interested in helping the side. So it was a completely confused situation. You wouldn't believe it, perhaps, or don't know it, perhaps, that on the German side was a brilliant young Zionist called Dr. Nahum Goldman, who later in life founded the World Jewish Congress. And he was employed by Hindenburg and Ludendorff to write pamphlets in the Yiddish language for the German army to drop by their hundreds of thousands in Poland, in the Ukraine, to say, Jewish brothers and sisters, help us to fight the Tsar, who is the man who killed your kith and kin. This was the confused situation. And in this race for getting America into the war, the British won the race, and Weizmann won the race because he made friends with Lloyd George, made friends with Balfour, and got in 1917 the Balfour Declaration. And this is an extraordinary story. And I am in the happy position now also to talk to you about Herzl the Redeemer, because tonight we have some very important, distinguished guests. We have the great-grandson of the Grand Duke of Baden, the great friend of Herzl, His Royal Highness Prince Michael. Prince Michael, may I ask you to stand up? We have here today Count and Countess Hardenberg. Count Hardenberg is the great-great-grandson of Prince Hardenberg, the Prime Minister of Prussia in the Napoleonic Wars, who raised the ghettos to the ground and legislated the emancipation of German Jews. Andreas, get up. Both the Grand Duke, his royal family, his Royal Highness's family, and our friend Count Christoph Douglas, and our friends from the Hardenbergs are still continuing in their wonderful collaboration with the State of Israel, helping economically and culturally, and in playing a very important part in the rapprochement between Germans and Jews. I'm very proud that they could come here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, since we have now all these German friends here, I want to also mention Mr. Elmer Brock, one of the leading politicians and leader of the CDU in Strasbourg Parliament, a very influential man both in Europe and in the Federal in the German Republic. We have here my great friend Stefan Sattler, one of the leading cultural figures in Germany, 
and right-hand man of Hubert Bose, the publisher, whose father was ambassador to the Holy See and the Adenauer, and who converted to Judaism and is married to one of the great Jewish intellectuals in Germany, Rachel Salamander. Stefan, get up. And I, I want to greet Mr. Elmer Brock, I want to greet Frau Seibel, the managing editor of the Axel Springer daily paper, Die Welt, for whom I have the honor to write a regular column, and Mr. Kielinger, the distinguished Axel Springer Welt correspondent in this country, a great intellectual and wonderful journalist. I hope I haven't uh, in, uh, eliminated, I haven't uh, uh, forgotten anybody, but I now have another little surprise for you. I would like to ask my great friend and road companion, Svi Metal, the great philanthropist and great collector of historical memorabilia, who has brought with him copies of a seal of Theodor Herzl's letter of thanks and stamp for the Duke of Baden, thanking him for his help. Svi, will you get up and do your duty? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think I have only one passing thought to communicate with you, and this is my last uh, part of my perhaps overlong spe uh, uh, speech. Um, nowhere in the copious, voluminous correspondence published by Theodor Herzl, nowhere in his two great novels, is there any critical word, let alone hostile word, about Arabs or Palestinians. On the contrary, the romantic Theodor Herzl had the hope that they would be neighbors working together. He thought that the mighty Arab nation under the Ottoman yoke would become free, would turn into a multitude of sovereign countries, monarchies, republics, and there would still be room for a Jewish state next to an Arab state. And he hoped that this Semitic brotherhood, as he put it, cousinhood, as he put it also in another place, would come to pass. And I want to end up with my hope that this will happen and that this last most important part of Theodor Herschel's prophecy is one day soon become reality. Thank you very much. George, before I give you the Theodore Herzl Award, I want to say that in my 25 years of being involved in Jewish work, and particularly hundreds, if not thousands of dinners, this is one of the best and most unique speech I have ever heard. Um, and I thank you, it's amazing. And he did most of it without notes. Amazing. Anyway, I have here the Theodor Herzl Award. It's a bust of Theodor Herzl. I lift it up, but it weighs about 200 pounds. Uh, and it's on a piece of Jerusalem stone. George, we give it to you on behalf of the Jewish people for everything you've done and everything you will do. And um, I must tell you, you are unique, you are special, and we all love you. George, thank you. I have here three letters that I'd like to read to you. The first, it says, Dear friends, I send warm greetings from Jerusalem on this year's um, World Jewish Congress Theodor Herzl Award Dinner. 
Since its inception, the World Jewish Congress has embodied the principles that Jew all Jews are responsible for one another and has worked tirelessly to strengthen the unity between Jews and the world and with the State of Israel by focusing on Jewish identity and the values uh, the World Jewish Congress helps ensure Jewish continuity. This year's Theodore Herzl Award recipient, Lord Weidenfeld, has dedicated his life to these ideals. He is rightly recognized and celebrated for his dedication, bettering the lives around him, especially through his commitment to higher education, both in Israel and across Europe. Throughout his life, he has championed the Jewish state and has worked for, to foster a better understanding of Israel's role in a broader struggle to establish a more stable and secure world. Congratulations to Lord Weidenfeld on this well-deserved honor. Sincerely, Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, as you know, there was a contest. <laughs> between Bibi and Bougie. And they both wanted their letter read, read first. So we just tossed a, current, a coin. This is from Bougie Hatsad. Dear George, I'm delighted to congratulate you on your richly deserved award. Celebrations in your honor are usually auspicious occasions, so much so that my father dedicated an entire page to his autobiography to discuss your 70th birthday. I suppose it's only fair, since you are, of course, the one who published the autobiography of my late father and your friend Chaim Herzog, who, along with my mother and my entire family, consider you a very close and a friendship I've been honored to inherit. Only a few months ago, I had the great pleasure of celebrating your 95th birthday. Your life is intimately bound up with the Jewish story of the last century. You carry with you the memories of your darkest time when as a teenager growing up in Vienna, you experienced the rise of Nazism and escaped to slaughter as a refugee. It would have been unimaginable that in 2015, we would have a Jewish state of 8 million people more than six million of them Jews, whose economy, technological achievements, arts and literature are admired throughout the world. Of course, your impact and contribution goes far beyond the Jewish world. Personally, I have greatly benefited from, the re from your reason and wisdom of your counsel. On frequent occasions, I have had the opportunity to spend time with you. For the Jewish people, you are a source of wisdom, like a modern-day Solomon, only without the thousand wives. For me personally, you are like a father figure. Congratulations, George, on this richly deserved award, and thank you for both your friendship to me and my family, and for your contribution to Israel and the Jewish people. Kisses to Annabelle, sincerely yours, um, Isaac Herzog. Now the th <laughs> now the third letter, we had a lot of fun doing because we thought, what would Theodore Herzl have written to George? This is from Theodore Herzl. Dear George, congratulations, as they say in Vienna, Mazel tov. You have won a very great prize the Theodore Herzl Award, which I must say has a great ring to it. I love the name. You know, we have a great deal in common. We both lived in Vienna, although the Vienna I knew and the one you experienced was slightly different. We both care about the Jewish people and the state of Israel. Although you were there at the dawning, I was there at the inception. We both published important works, although you certainly published a lot more than I did. Perhaps 
the most important thing we have in common is our shared and rock solid belief in an old Zionist saying, if you will it, it is no dream. Although my story stopped at the beginning of the 20th century, yours has continued into the 21st century. It has not been an easy road, but I can't think of anything in life with, worth living that comes easy. Millions of Jews turn their dreams into reality. With my utmost respect and with my name on your prize, I offer you a hearty Mazel Tov. Sincerely, Theodor Herzl. And at the end, it was, it was pointed out to me that behind me is a picture of St. George killing the dragon. I think it's very apropos of what George has done. Thank you very much, and have a good evening.